Chapter 5, Part 1 of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Bobby. A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. Chapter 5, Part 1. He drained his third cup of watery tea to the dregs, and set to chewing the crusts of fried bread that were scattered near him, staring into the dark pool of the jar. The yellow dripping had been scooped out like a bog-hole, and the pool under it brought back to his memory the dark, turf-coloured water of the bath in Klongos. The box of pawn-tickets at his elbow had just been rifled, and he took up idly, one after another in his greasy fingers, the blue and white dockets, scrawled and sanded and creased, and bearing the name of the pledger as Daly or McAvoy. One pair buskins, one D. coat, three articles and white, one man's pants. Then he put them aside and gazed thoughtfully at the lid of the box, speckled with louse marks, and asked vaguely, "'How much is the clock fast now?' His mother straightened the battered alarm clock that was lying on its side in the middle of the kitchen mantelpiece, until its dial showed a quarter to twelve, and then laid it once more on its side. "'An hour and twenty-five minutes,' she said. "'The right time now is twenty past ten. The dear knows you might try to be in time for your lectures. Fill out the place for me to wash, said Stephen. Katie, fill out the place for Stephen to wash. Booty, fill out the place for Stephen to wash. I can't, I'm going for blue. Fill it out, you, Maggie. When the enameled basin had been fitted into the well of the sink, and the old washing-glove flung on the side of it, he allowed his mother to scrub his neck and root into the folds of his ears, and into the interstices at the wings of his nose. "'Well, it's a poor case,' she said, "'when a university student is so dirty that his mother has to wash him.' "'But it gives you pleasure,' said Stephen calmly. An ear-splitting whistle was heard from upstairs, and his mother thrust a damp overall into his hands, saying, "'Dry yourself and hurry out, for the love of goodness.' A second shrill whistle, prolonged angrily, brought one of the girls to the foot of the staircase. "'Yes, father?' "'Is your lazy bitch of a brother gone out yet?' "'Yes, father?' "'Sure?' "'Yes, father?' "'Hmm.' The girl came back, making signs to him to be quick and go out quietly by the back. Stephen laughed and said, "'He has a curious idea of genders if he thinks a bitch is masculine.' "'Oh, it's a scandalous shame for you, Stephen.' said his mother, and you live to rue the day you set your foot in that place. I know how it has changed you. "'Good morning, everybody,' said Stephen, smiling and kissing the tips of his fingers in adieu. The lane behind the terrace was waterlogged, and as he went down it slowly, choosing his steps amid heaps of wet rubbish, he heard a mad nun screeching in the nun's madhouse beyond the wall. "'Jesus! Oh, Jesus!' Jesus! He shook the sound out of his ears by an angry toss of his head and hurried on, stumbling through the mouldering offal, his heart already bitten by an ache of loathing and bitterness. His father's whistle, his mother's mutterings, the screech of an unseen maniac were to him now so many voices offending and threatening to humble the pride of his youth. He drove their echoes even out of his heart with an execration, but, as he walked down the avenue and felt the grey morning light falling about him through the dripping trees and smelt the strange wild smell of the wet leaves and bark, his soul was loosed of her miseries. The rain-laden trees of the avenue evoked in him, as always, memories of the girls and women in the plays of Gerhard Hauptmann and the memory of their pale sorrows, and the fragrance falling from the wet branches, mingled in a mood of quiet joy. His morning walk across the city had begun, and he foreknew that as he passed the slob-lands of Fairview he would think of the cloistral, silver-veined prose of Newman. 
that as he walked along the North Strand Road, glancing idly at the windows of the provision shops, he would recall the dark humour of Guido Cavalcanti and smile that as he went by Baird's stone-cutting works in Talbot Place, the spirit of Ibsen would blow through him like a keen wind, a spirit of wayward boyish beauty, and that passing a grimy marine-dealer's shop beyond the Liffey, he would repeat the song by Ben Jonson which begins, I was not wearier where I lay. His mind, when wearied of its search for the essence of beauty amid the spectral words of Aristotle or Aquinas, turned often for its pleasure to the dainty songs of the Elizabethans. His mind, in the vesture of a doubting monk, stood often in shadow under the windows of that age, to hear the grave and mocking music of the lutenists, or the frank laughter of wesketeers, until a laugh too low, a phrase, tarnished by time, of chambering and false honour, stung his monkish pride, and drove him on from his lurking-place. The lore which he was believed to pass his days brooding upon, so that it had wrapped him from the companionships of youth, was only a garner of slender sentences from Aristotle's poetics and psychology, and a synopsis philosophiae scholasticae ad mentem divi tome. His thinking was a dusk of doubt and self-mistrust, lit up at moments by the lightnings of intuition but lightnings of so clear a splendour that in those moments the world perished about his feet as if it had been fire-consumed. And thereafter his tongue grew heavy, and he met the eyes of others with unanswering eyes, for he felt that the spirit of beauty had folded him round like a mantle, and that in reverie at least he had been acquainted with nobility. But when this brief pride of silence upheld him no longer, he was glad to find himself still in the midst of common lives, passing on his way amid the squalor and noise and sloth of the city, fearlessly and with a light heart. Near the hoardings on the canal he met the consumptive man with the doll's face and the brimless hat, coming towards him down the slope of the bridge with little steps, tightly buttoned into his chocolate overcoat, and holding his furled umbrella a span or two from him like a divining rod. It must be eleven, he thought, and peered into a dairy to see the time. The clock in the dairy told him that it was five minutes to five, but, as he turned away, he heard a clock somewhere near him, but unseen, beating eleven strokes in swift precision. He laughed as he heard it, for it made him think of McCann, and he saw him a squat figure in a shooting jacket and breeches, and with a fair goatee, standing in the wind at Hopkins' corner, and heard him say, Daedalus, you're an antisocial being, wrapped up in yourself. I'm not. I'm a Democrat, and I'll work and act for social liberty and equality among all classes and sexes in the United States of the Europe of the future. Eleven. And then he was late for that lecture, too. What day of the week was it? He stopped at a newsagent's to read the headline of a placard. Thursday. Ten to eleven, English. Eleven to twelve, French. Twelve to one, Physics. He fancied to himself the English lecture, and felt, even at that distance, restless and helpless. He saw the heads of his classmates meekly bent as they wrote in their notebooks the points they were bidden to note, nominal definitions, essential definitions, and examples or dates of birth or death, chief works, a favourable and an unfavourable criticism side by side. His own head was unbent, for his thoughts wandered abroad, and whether he looked around the little class of students or out of the window across the desolate gardens of the green, an odour assailed him of cheerless cellar-damp and decay. Another head than his, right before him in the first benches, was poised squarely above its bending fellows like the head of a priest appealing without humility to the tabernacle for the humble worshippers about him. Why was it that when he thought of Cranley he could never raise before his mind the entire image of his body, but only the image of the head and face? Even now, against the grey curtain of the morning, he saw it before him like the phantom of a dream, the face of a severed head or death-mask, crowned on the brows by its stiff, black, upright hair, as by an iron crown. It was a priest-like face, priest-like in its pallor, in the wide-winged nose, 
in the shadowings below the eyes and along the jaws, priest-like in the lips that were long and bloodless and faintly smiling. And Stephen, remembering swiftly how he had told Cranley of all the tumults and unrest and longings in his soul, day after day and night by night, only to be answered by his friend's listening silence, would have told himself that it was the face of a guilty priest who heard confessions of those whom he had not power to absolve, but that he felt again in memory the gaze of its dark, womanish eyes. Through this image he had a glimpse of a strange, dark cavern of speculation, but at once turned away from it, feeling that it was not yet the hour to enter it. But the nightshade of his friend's listlessness seemed to be diffusing in the air around him a tenuous and deadly exhalation, and he found himself glancing from one casual word to another on his right or left in stolid wonder that they had been so silently emptied of instantaneous sense, until every mean shop-legend bound his mind like the words of a spell, and his soul shriveled up, sighing with age as he walked on in a lane among heaps of dead language. His own consciousness of language was ebbing from his brain, and trickling into the very words themselves, which set to band and disband themselves in wayward rhythms. The ivy winds upon the wall, and winds and winds upon the wall, the ivy winds upon the wall, the yellow ivy on the wall, ivy, ivy, up the wall. Did any one ever hear such drivel, Lord Almighty? Who ever heard of ivy whining on a wall? Yellow ivy, that was all right. Yellow ivory also. And what about ivory ivy? The word now shone in his brain, clearer and brighter than any ivory sawn from the mottled tusks of elephants. Ivory, ivoire, avorio, ebur. One of the first examples that he had learnt in Latin had run, India mitit ebur and he recalled the shrewd northern face of the rector who had taught him to construe the metamorphoses of Ovid in a courtly English, made whimsical by the mention of porkers and potsherds and chines of bacon. He had learnt what little he knew of the laws of Latin verse from a ragged book written by a Portuguese priest. Contrahit orator, variant in carmine vates. The crises and victories and secessions in Roman history were handed on to him in the trite words in tanto discrimine, and he had tried to peer into the social life of the city of cities through the words implere olam denariorum, which the rector had rendered sonorously as the filling of a pot with denaries. The pages of his time-worn Horace never felt cold to the touch, even when his own fingers were cold. They were human pages and fifty years before they had been turned by the human fingers of John Duncan Inverarity and by his brother, William Malcolm Inverarity. Yes, those were noble names on the dusky fly-leaf, and, even for so poor a Latinist as he, the dusky verses were as fragrant as though they had lain all those years in myrtle and lavender and vervain. But yet it wounded him to think that he would never be but a shy guest at the feast of the world's culture, and that the monkish learning, in terms of which he was striving to forge out an aesthetic philosophy, was held no higher by the age he lived in than the subtle and curious jargons of heraldry and falconry. The grey block of Trinity on his left, set heavily in the city's ignorance like a great dull stone set in a cumbrous ring, pulled his mind downward, and while he was striving this way and that to free his feet from the fetters of the reformed conscience, he came upon the droll statue of the national poet of Ireland. He looked at it without anger, for, though sloth of the body and of the soul crept over it like unseen vermin, over the shuffling feet and up the folds of the cloak and around the servile head it seemed humbly conscious of its indignity. It was a fur bowl in the borrowed cloak of a Milesian, and he thought of his friend Davin, the peasant student, it was a jesting name between them, but the young peasant bore with it lightly, saying, "'Go on, Stevie. I have a hard head. You tell me. Call me what you will.' The homely version of his Christian name on the lips of his friend had touched Stephen pleasantly when first heard, 
for he was as formal in speech with others as they were with him. Often, as he sat in Davin's rooms in Grantham Street, wondering at his friend's well-made boots that flanked the wall pair by pair, and repeating for his friend's simple ear the verses and cadences of others, which were the veils of his own longing and dejection, the rude furbolg mind of his listener had drawn his mind towards it and flung it back again, drawing it by a quiet, inbred courtesy of attention, or by a quaint turn of old English speech, or by the force of its delight in rude bodily skill, for Davin had sat at the feet of Michael Cusack the Gael. Repelling swiftly and suddenly by a grossness of intelligence, or by a bluntness of feeling, or by a dull stare of terror in the eyes, the terror of soul of a starving Irish village in which the curfew was still a nightly fear. Side by side with his memory of the deeds of prowess of his uncle Matt Davin, the athlete, the young peasant worshipped the sorrowful legend of Ireland. The gossip of his fellow-students, which strove to render the flat life of the college significant at any cost, loved to think of him as a rude Fenian. His nurse had taught him Irish, and shaped his rude imagination by the broken lights of Irish myth. He stood towards this myth, upon which no individual mind had ever drawn out a line of beauty, and to its unwieldy tales that divided themselves as they moved down the cycles in the same attitude as towards the Roman Catholic religion, the attitude of a dull-witted, loyal serf. Whatsoever of thought or of feeling came to him from England or by way of English culture, his mind stood armed against in obedience to a password and of the world that lay beyond England he knew only the foreign legion of France in which he spoke of serving. Coupling this ambition with the young man's humour, Stephen had often called him one of the tame geese, and there was even a point of irritation in the name pointed against that very reluctance of speech and deed in his friend which seemed so often to stand between Stephen's mind, eager of speculation, and the hidden ways of Irish life. One night the young peasant, his spirit stung by the violent or luxurious language in which Stephen escaped from the cold silence of intellectual revolt, had called up before Stephen's mind a strange vision. The two were walking slowly towards Davin's rooms through the dark narrow streets of the poorer Jews. "'A thing happened to myself, Stevie, last autumn, coming on winter, and I never told it to a living soul, and you are the first person now I ever told it to.' I disremember if it was October or November. It was October, because it was before I came up here to join the matriculation class. Stephen had turned his smiling eyes towards his friend's face, flattered by his confidence and won over to sympathy by the speaker's simple accent. I was away all that day from my own place over in Buttevant. I don't know if you know where that is and a hurling match between the Croke's own boys and the fearless Thurls, and, by God, Stevie, that was the hard fight. My first cousin, Fonzie Davin, was stripped to his buff that day, minding cool for the limericks, but he was up with the forwards half the time and shouting like mad. I never will forget that day. One of the Croke's made a woeful wipe at him one time with his cannon, and I declare to God he was within an aim's ace of getting it at the side of the temple. Oh, honest to God, if the crook of it caught him that time, he was done for. I am glad he escaped, Stephen had said with a laugh, but surely that's not the strange thing that happened to you. Well, I suppose that doesn't interest you, but leastways there was such noise after the match that I missed the train home, and I couldn't get any kind of yoke to give me a lift for, as luck would have it. There was a mass meeting that same day over in Castle Townrush, and all the cars in the country were there. So there was nothing for it only to stay the night or to foot it out. Well, I started to walk, and on I went, and it was coming on night when I got to the Ballyhoura Hills. That's better than ten miles from Kilmallock, and there's a long, lonely road after that. You wouldn't see the sign of a Christian house along that road, or hear a sound. It was pitch dark almost. Once or twice I stopped by the way under a bush to redden my pipe, and only for the dew was thick I'd have stretched out there and slept. At last, after a bend of the road, I spied a little cottage with a light in the window. I went up and knocked at the door. A voice asked who was there, and I answered I was over at the match in Buttevant, and was walking back, 
and that I'd be thankful for a glass of water. After a while a young woman opened the door and brought me out a big mug of milk. She was half undressed as if she was going to bed when I knocked, and she had her hair hanging. And I thought by her figure and by something in the look of her eyes that she must be carrying a child. She kept me in talk a long while at the door, and I thought it strange because her breast and her shoulders were bare. She asked me was I tired and would I like to stop the night there. She said she was all alone in the house and that her husband had gone that morning to Queenstown with his sister to see her off. And all the time she was talking, Stevie, she had her eyes fixed on my face and she stood so close to me I could hear her breathing. When I handed her back the mug at last, she took my hand to draw me in over the threshold and said, Come in and stay the night here. You've got no call to be frightened. There's no one in it but ourselves. I didn't go in, Stevie. I thanked her and went on my way again, all in a fever. At the first bend of the road I looked back, and she was standing at the door. The last words of Davin's story sang in his memory, and the figure of the woman in the story stood forth, reflected in other figures of the peasant women whom he had seen standing in the doorways at Clane as the college cars drove by, as a type of her race and his own, a bat-like soul waking to the consciousness of itself in darkness and secrecy and loneliness, and, through the eyes and voice and gesture of a woman without guile, calling the stranger to her bed. A hand was laid on his arm, and the young voice cried, "'Ah, gentlemen, your own girl, sir! The first Hansel to-day, gentlemen, buy that lovely bunch, will you, gentlemen?' The blue flowers which she lifted towards him and her young blue eyes seemed to him at that instant images of guilelessness, and he halted till the image had vanished, and he saw only her ragged dress and damp coarse hair and hoydenish face. "'Do, gentlemen, don't forget your own girl, sir.' "'I have no money,' said Stephen. "'Buy them lovely ones, will you, sir? Only a penny.' "'Did you hear what I said?' asked Stephen, bending towards her. I told you I had no money. I tell you again now. Well, sure, you will some day, sir, please God, the girl answered after an instant. Possibly, said Stephen, but I don't think it likely. He left her quickly, fearing that her intimacy might turn into jibing and wishing to be out of the way before she offered her ware to another, a tourist from England or a student of Trinity. Grafton Street, along which he walked, prolonged that moment of discouraged poverty. In the roadway at the head of the street a slab was set to the memory of Wolf Tone, and he remembered having been present with his father at its laying. He remembered with bitterness that scene of tawdry tribute. There were four French delegates in a break, and one, a plump, smiling young man, held, wedged on a stick, a card on which were printed the words, Vive l'Irlande! But the trees in Stephen's green were fragrant of rain, and the rain-sodden earth gave forth its mortal odor, a faint incense rising upward through the mold from many hearts. The soul of the gallant venal city which his elders had told him of had shrunk with time to a faint mortal odor rising from the earth, and he knew that in a moment when he entered the sombre college he would be conscious of a corruption other than that of Buck Egan and Burn Chapel Whaley. It was too late to go upstairs to the French class. He crossed the hall and took the corridor to the left which led to the physics theatre. The corridor was dark and silent, but not unwatchful. Why did he feel that it was not unwatchful? Was it because he had heard that in Buck Whaley's time there was a secret staircase there? Or was the Jesuit house extraterritorial, and was he walking among aliens? The Ireland of Tone and of Parnell seemed to have receded in space. He opened the door of the theatre and halted in the chilly grey light that struggled through the dusty windows. A figure was crouching before the large grate, and by its leanness and greyness he knew that it was the Dean of Studies lighting the fire. Stephen closed the door quietly and approached the fireplace. "'Good morning, sir. Can I help you?' The priest looked up quickly and said, "'One moment now, Mr. Dedalus, and you will see. There is an art in lighting a fire. 
We have the liberal arts, and we have the useful arts. This is one of the useful arts. I will try to learn it, said Stephen. Not too much coal, said the dean, working briskly at his task. That is one of the secrets. He produced four candle-butts from the side-pockets of his soutane and placed them deftly among the coals and twisted papers. Stephen watched him in silence. Kneeling thus on the flagstone to kindle the fire, and busied with the disposition of his wisps of paper and candle-butts, he seemed more than ever a humble server making ready the place of sacrifice in an empty temple, a Levite of the Lord. Like a Levite's robe of plain linen, the faded worn soutane draped the kneeling figure of one whom the canonicals or the bell-bordered ephod would irk and trouble. His very body had waxed old in lowly service of the Lord, in tending the fire upon the altar, in bearing tidings secretly, in waiting upon worldlings, in striking swiftly when bidden, and yet had remained ungraced by aught of saintly or of prelatic beauty. Nay, his very soul had waxed old at that service, without growing towards light and beauty, or spreading abroad a sweet odour of her sanctity. A mortified will, no more responsive to the thrill of its obedience than was to the thrill of love or combat his ageing body, spare and sinewy, grayed with a silver-pointed down. The dean rested back on his hunkers and watched the sticks catch. Stephen, to fill the silence, said, I am sure I could not light a fire. You are an artist, are you not, Mr. Dedalus? said the dean, glancing up and blinking his pale eyes. The object of the artist is the creation of the beautiful. What the beautiful is, is another question. He rubbed his hands slowly and dryly over the difficulty. Can you solve that question now? he asked. Aquinas, answered Stephen, says pulcra sunt quae visa placent. This fire before us, said the dean, will be pleasing to the eye. Will it therefore be beautiful? In so far as it is apprehended by the sight, which I suppose means here aesthetic intellection, it will be beautiful. But Aquinas also says, Bonum est in quod tendit appetitus. In so far as it satisfies the animal craving for warmth, fire is a good. In hell, however, it is an evil. Quite so, said the dean. You have certainly hit the nail on the head. He rose nimbly and went towards the door, set it ajar, and said, A draft is said to be a help in these matters. As he came back to the hearth, limping slightly but with a brisk step, Stephen saw the silent soul of a Jesuit look out at him from the pale, loveless eyes. Like Ignatius he was lame, but in his eyes burned no spark of Ignatius' enthusiasm. Even the legendary craft of the company, a craft subtler and more secret than its fabled books of secret subtled wisdom, had not fired his soul with the energy of apostleship. It seemed as if he used the shifts and lore and cunning of the world, as bidden to do, for the greater glory of God, without joy in their handling, or hatred of that in them which was evil, but turning them, with a firm gesture of obedience, back upon themselves. And for all this silent service it seemed as if he loved not at all the Master, and little, if at all, the ends he served. Similiter atque senis abaculus he was, as the founder would have had him, like a staff in an old man's hand, to be left in a corner, to be leaned on in the road at nightfall or in stress of weather, to lie with a lady's nosegay on a garden seat, to be raised in menace. The dean returned to the hearth and began to stroke his chin. When may we expect to have something from you on the aesthetic question? he asked. From me, said Stephen in astonishment. I stumble on an idea once a fortnight if I'm lucky. These questions are very profound, Mr. Dedalus, said the dean. It is like looking down from the cliffs of Moher into the depths. Many go down into the depths and never come up. Only the trained diver can go down into those depths and explore them and come to the surface again. If you mean speculation, sir, said Stephen, 
I also am sure that there is no such thing as free thinking inasmuch as all thinking must be bound by its own laws. Ha! Ah. For my purpose I can work on at present by the light of one or two ideas of Aristotle and Aquinas. I see. I quite see your point. I need them only for my own use and guidance until I have done something for myself by their light. If the lamp smokes or smells, I shall try to trim it. If it does not give light enough, I shall sell it and buy another. Epictetus also had a lamp, said the dean, which was sold for a fancy price after his death. It was the lamp he wrote his philosophical dissertations by. Uh, you know Epictetus. An old gentleman, said Stephen coarsely, who said that the soul is very like a bucketful of water. He tells us in his homely way, the dean went on, that he put an iron lamp before a statue of one of the gods, and that a thief stole the lamp. What did the philosopher do? He reflected that it was in the character of a thief to steal, and determined to buy an earthen lamp next day instead of the iron lamp. A smell of molten tallow came up from the dean's candle-butts and fused itself in Stephen's consciousness with the jingle of the words, bucket and lamp and lamp and bucket. The priest's voice, too, had a hard, jingling tone. Stephen's mind, halted by instinct, checked by the strange tone and the imagery, and by the priest's face, which seemed like an unlit lamp or a reflector hung in a false focus. What lay behind it or within it? a dull torpor of the soul, or the dullness of the thundercloud, charged with intellection and capable of the gloom of God? "'I meant a different kind of lamp, sir,' said Stephen. "'Undoubtedly,' said the dean. "'One difficulty,' said Stephen, "'in aesthetic discussion is to know whether words are being used according to the literary tradition or according to the tradition of the marketplace.' I remember a sentence of Newman's, in which he says of the Blessed Virgin that she was detained in the full company of the saints. The use of the word in the marketplace is quite different. I hope I am not detaining you. Not in the least, said the dean politely. No, no, said Stephen, smiling. I mean... Yes, yes, I see, said the dean quickly. I quite catch the point. Detain. He thrust forward his under jaw and uttered a dry, short cough. "'To return to the lamp,' he said, "'the feeding of it is also a nice problem. You must choose the pure oil, and you must be careful when you pour it in not to overflow it, not to pour in more than the funnel can hold.' "'What funnel?' asked Stephen. "'The funnel through which you pour the oil into your lamp.' "'That?' said Stephen. "'Is that called a funnel?' Is it not a tundish? What is a tundish? That, the, the funnel. Is that called a tundish in Ireland? asked the dean. I never heard the word in my life. It is called a tundish in Lower Drumcondra, said Stephen, laughing, where they speak the best English. A tundish, said the dean reflectively. That is a most interesting word. I must look that word up. Upon my word I must. His courtesy of manner rang a little false, and Stephen looked at the English convert with the same eyes as the elder brother in the parable may have turned on the prodigal. A humble follower in the wake of clamorous conversions, a poor Englishman in Ireland, he seemed to have entered on the stage of Jesuit history when that strange play of intrigue and suffering and envy and struggle and indignity had been all but given through a late comer, a tardy spirit. From what had he set out? Perhaps he had been born and bred among serious dissenters, seeing salvation in Jesus only and abhorring the vain pomps of the establishment. Had he felt the need of an implicit faith amid the welter of sectarianism and the jargon of its turbulent schisms, six principal men, peculiar people, seed and snake Baptists, supralapsarian dogmatists? Had he found the true church all of a sudden in winding up to the end like a reel of cotton some fine-spun line of reasoning upon insufflation or the imposition of hands or the procession of the Holy Ghost? Or had Lord Christ touched him and bidden him follow, 
like the disciple who had sat at the receipt of custom, as he sat by the door of some zinc-roofed chapel, yawning and telling over his church pence. The dean repeated the word yet again. Tundish. Well, now, that is interesting. The question you asked me a moment ago seems to me more interesting. What is that beauty which the artist struggles to express from lumps of earth? said Stephen coldly. The little word seemed to have turned a rapier point of his sensitiveness against this courteous and vigilant foe. He felt with a smart of dejection that the man to whom he was speaking was a countryman of Ben Jonson. He thought, The language in which we are speaking is his before it is mine. How different are the words home, Christ, ale, master, on his lips and on mine. I cannot speak or write these words without unrest of spirit. His language, so familiar and so foreign, will always be for me an acquired speech. I have not made or accepted its words. My voice holds them at bay. My soul frets in the shadow of his language. And to distinguish between the beautiful and the sublime, the dean added, to distinguish between moral beauty and material beauty, and to inquire what kind of beauty is proper to each of the various arts. There are some interesting points we might take up. Stephen, disheartened suddenly by the dean's firm, dry tone, was silent. The dean also was silent, and through the silence a distant noise of many boots and confused voices came up the staircase. In pursuing these speculations, said the dean conclusively, there is, however, the danger of perishing of inanition. First you must take your degree. Set that before you as your first aim. Then, little by little, you will see your way. I mean in every sense, your way in life and in thinking. It may be uphill peddling at first. Take Mr. Moonan. He was a long time before he got to the top, but he got there. I may not have his talent, said Stephen quietly. You never know, said the dean brightly. We never can say what is in us. I most certainly should not be despondent. Per aspera ad astra. He left the hearth quickly and went towards the landing to oversee the arrival of the first arts class. Leaning against the fireplace, Stephen heard him greet briskly and impartially every student of the class, and could almost see the frank smiles of the coarser students. A desolating pity began to fall like a dew upon his easily embittered heart for this faithful serving-man of the knightly Loyola, for this half-brother of the clergy, more venal than they in speech, more steadfast of soul than they, one whom he would never call his ghostly father. And he thought how this man and his companions had earned the name of worldlings at the hands not of the unworldly only, but of the worldly also, for having pleaded, during all their history, at the bar of God's justice for the souls of the lax and the lukewarm and the prudent. The entry of the professor was signalled by a few rounds of Kentish fire from the heavy boots of those students who sat on the highest tier of the gloomy theatre under the grey cobwebbed windows. The calling of the roll began, and the responses to the names were given out in all tones until the name of Peter Byrne was reached. Here. A deep bass note in response came from the upper tier, followed by coughs of protest along the other benches. The professor paused in his reading and called the next name. Cranley? No answer. Mr. Cranley? A smile flew across Stephen's face as he thought of his friend's studies. Try Leopardstown, said a voice from the bench behind. Stephen glanced up quickly, but Moynihan's snoutish face, outlined on the grey light, was impassive. A formula was given out. Amid the rustling of the notebooks, Stephen turned back again and said, "'Give me some paper, for God's sake!' "'Are you as bad as that?' asked Moynihan, with a broad grin. He tore a sheet from his scribbler and passed it down, whispering, "'In case of necessity, any layman or woman can do it.' The formula which he wrote obediently on the sheet of paper, the coiling and uncoiling calculations of the professor, the spectre-like symbols of force and velocity fascinated and jaded Stephen's mind. 
He had heard some say that the old professor was an atheist Freemason. Oh, the grey, dull day! It seemed a limbo of painless, patient consciousness through which souls of mathematicians might wander, projecting long, slender fabrics from plane to plane of ever rarer and paler twilight, radiating swift eddies to the last verges of a universe ever vaster, farther, and more impalpable. So we must distinguish between elliptical and ellipsoidal. Perhaps some of you gentlemen may be familiar with the works of Mr. W. S. Gilbert. In one of his songs he speaks of the billiard sharp, who is condemned to play on a cloth untrue with a twisted cue and elliptical billiard balls. He means a ball having the form of the ellipsoid of the principal axes of which I spoke a moment ago. Moynihan leaned down toward Stephen's ear and murmured, "'What price ellipsoidal balls? Chase me, ladies! I'm in the cavalry!' His fellow-student's rude humour rang like a gust through the cloister of Stephen's mind, shaking into gay life limp priestly vestments that hung upon the walls, setting them to sway and caper in a sabbath of misrule. The forms of the community emerged from the gust-blown vestments, the dean of studies, the portly florid bursar with his cap of grey hair, the president, the little priest with feathery hair who wrote devout verses, the squat peasant form of the professor of economics, the tall form of the young professor of mental science, discussing on the landing a case of conscience with his class, like a giraffe cropping high leafage among a herd of antelopes, the grave troubled prefect of the sodality, the plump round-headed professor of Italian, with his rogue's eyes. They came ambling and stumbling, tumbling and capering, kilting their gowns for leapfrog, holding one another back, shaken with deep false laughter, smacking one another behind and laughing at their rude malice, calling one another by familiar nicknames, protesting with sudden dignity at some rough usage, whispering two and two behind their hands. The professor had gone to the glass cases on the sidewall, from a shelf of which he took down a set of coils, blew away the dust from many points, and, bearing it carefully to the table, held a finger on it while he proceeded with his lecture. He explained that the wires in modern coils were of a compound called platinoid, lately discovered by F. W. Martino. He spoke clearly the initials and surname of the discoverer. Moynihan whispered from behind, "'Good old freshwater Martin!' "'Ask him,' Stephen whispered back with a weary humour, "'if he wants a subject for electrocution, he can have me.' Moynihan, seeing the professor bend over the coils, rose in his bench and, clacking noiselessly the fingers of his right hand, began to call with the voice of a slobbering urchin, "'Please, teacher, please, teacher, this boy is after saying a bad word, teacher.' Platinoid, the professor said solemnly, is preferred to German silver because it has a lower coefficient of resistance variation by changes of temperature. The platinoid wire is insulated, and the covering of silk that insulates it is wound on the ebonite bobbins just where my finger is. If it were wound single, an extra current would be induced in the coils. The bobbins are saturated in hot paraffin wax. A sharp Ulster voice said from the bench below Stephen, are we likely to be asked questions on applied science? The professor began to juggle gravely with the terms pure science and applied science. The heavy-built student wearing gold spectacles stared with some wonder at the questioner. Moynihan murmured from behind in his natural voice, Isn't McAllister a devil for his pound of flesh? Stephen looked down coldly on the oblong skull beneath him overgrown with tangled twine-colored hair. The voice, the accent, the mind of the questioner offended him, and he allowed the offence to carry him towards willful unkindness, bidding his mind think that the student's father would have done better had he sent his son to Belfast to study, and have saved something on the train fares by so doing. The oblong skull beneath did not turn to meet this shaft of thought, and yet the shaft came back to its bowstring, for he saw in a moment the student's way-pale face. That thought is not mine, he said to himself quickly. It came from the comic Irishman in the bench behind. Patience! Can you say with certitude by whom the soul of your race was bartered and its elect betrayed? By the questioner 
or by the mocker. Patience. Remember Epictetus. It is probably in his character to ask such a question at such a moment in such a tone, and to pronounce the word science as a monosyllable. The droning voice of the professor continued to wind itself slowly round and round the coils it spoke of, doubling, trebling, quadrupling its somnolent energy as the coil multiplied its ohms of resistance. Moynihan's voice called from behind in echo to a distant bell. "'Closing time, gents!' End of chapter 5, part 1 of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man